and Global Hospitals in Mumbai. He is ex-professor and head department of orthopedics at KJ Sumaya Hospital and Medical College, Mumbai, and is the ex-senior visiting consultant at Saifi, Vokart, Fortis, and various other hospitals in Mumbai. Sir is past president, Association of Spine Surgeons of India, Bombay Orthopedic Society, Bombay Spine Society, Chief National Delegate for APSS, and Council Member APOA. Sir has pioneered MICOS, that is Minimal Invasive Cosmetic Spine Surgery in India and used endoscopic spine surgery for the first time in India in 1998 to do thoracoscopic release in scoliosis, debrima and biopsy of lesions in dorsal lumbar spine anteriorly, and ETS for hyperhidrosis. Sir has received J.B. Modi Gold Medal Award for Neurotrauma, Spine Instrumentation Fellowship, from Germany, Barrows Neurological Institute Fellowship from Phoenix, Arizona, US, Nucleoplasty from Feuerberg, Germany, Scoliosis Fellowship from St. Louis, US, and Minimal Invasive Spine Surgery from Seoul, Korea. So thank you very much once again for being with us today. Over to you. You may please commence with your track presentations. Thank you. Good evening, friends. Thank you, Shobit, for the kind introduction. I'm Dr. Ram Chagda, and I welcome you as the program director for the Boot OTA Spinal Trauma section. I am indeed most privileged to have with me two extremely well-trained colleagues who excel not just as surgeons, but as teachers. May I welcome Dr. Timothy Moore. Tim comes from Cleveland, Ohio. He's a consultant spine surgeon at the Metro Health Spine Center and has been in spine practice 18 years dedicated to only spine and is extremely proficient with everything right from the nape of the neck to the sacrum. And he is going to be actively participating with us today. Welcome, Tim. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. We have the young Turk from Mumbai, India, Dr. Vishal Kunnani, probably one of the most aggressive, brilliant, and talented young surgeons who has actually excelled himself both at occipital cervical junction and minimally invasive spine surgery. He's presently working at the Bombay Hospital and the Leelawati Hospital. He is a clinical director and head spine clinic, Mumbai Institute of Spine Surgery, and would be with me, the other Indian faculty who would add value to our international faculty, Tim Moore. Without much ado, may I call upon our first speaker, Dr. Vishal Kunnani. We are going to be going about three sections. We'll be doing thoracolumbar trauma first, which will be a didactic lecture followed by two videos. Then we go to cervical spine trauma, which is again a small didactic lecture, followed by an interesting case presentation, followed by a video. And finally, we're going to go to certain interesting miscellaneous areas, that is sacral fractures and osteoporotic vertical fractures. So, May I call upon the first speaker, Dr. Vishal Kunnani, to share his knowledge and experience about modern classification systems in thoracolumbar spine trauma. Vishal, all yours. I am muting myself, and you should please unmute. Thank you, Dr. Ramchaga, and uh, thank you, Dr. Tim, for having me around here. This is an absolute pleasure to share the, the slides with you all on modern classification systems in thoracolumbar spine trauma. We have all gone through various classification systems during our conventional training programs in orthopedics. And we have seen Magrel and Dennis classifying on various ways that particular kind of fracture can be classified into different types. Like in this particular case scenario, a 47-year-old male who had a road traffic accident with normal neurology while presenting. <clears throat> the first question that comes to our mind is, what kind of fracture is this? Is it a wedge compression, a burst fracture, or a chance fracture? 
Is it a stable or unstable one? And the biggest question is, shall I conserve or I operate upon this particular patient? Another very similar looking x-ray, but this time a patient with complete paraplegia and diagnosed as burst fracture with 0 by 5 power in both the lower limbs. The question arises, what is the role of steroids in them? Is there a way to define when would the surgery benefit maximal? And if at all, is surgery really recommended in these patients or these are stable burst fractures? And this question further adds to the enigma of the universe. Another type of fracture here, where the fracture is present only in the posterior half of the body with no wedging of the anterior half and the posterior column is also intact. What kind of fracture is this? Is there a classification to really cover up these kind of atypical fractures? And if yes, do we really conserve these fractures? What is the prognosis of these fractures? Is it recommended to go and operate in these cases or not? Again, these questions create an enigma. And multiple such questions keep arising whenever we see patients with thoracolumbar spine trauma. What type of fracture are these? Do I need to operate on these patients? What are the objective criteria to decide what type of surgery? <clears throat> if surgery whether anterior or posteriorly, should I be doing it in a planned manner or an emergency? And if at all you have to instrument, should I be doing a short segment fixation or a long segment fixation? What are the cases where post-traumatic kyphosis is more prone to happen compared to the other ones? Is there an answer to this? The answer to these questions often lies in simple classification systems, what we call often modern classification systems. Yes, there are uh, there are there are consensus to to what we are talking. What I'm talking about here is that. Give me a second, please. Just one second. Sorry, I'm. Yeah, sorry. So, so there are these questions that come to our mind, whom to operate, when to operate and how to operate and what are the role of steroids. <clears throat> we have known that the, the indications for surgery when on whom to operate comes from the classification that we started way back in 1964 where White and Punjabi et al. came with classification of spinal instability, stating that any patient who has a structural integrity loss with, with physiological loss should be operated because these are unstable. And there have been various classification systems that have come across following this stabilization concept based on the instability concept of Magrel and Punjabi et al. The various classification that we have come across so far is Magrel's two-column concept, then his three-column concept, AO classification systems, and thoracolumbar injury CVRTs for classification systems, and the newer ones like load sharing classification. Let's go by them one by one. Magrel divided the whole concept of classifying the fractures based purely on the two-column concept, stating that there is an anterior column and there is a posterior column. And of course, it was a brilliant effort to give equal importance to both the columns of weight-bearing anterior column and tension band of posterior column. And this was the first time where pathomorphological classification of fractures was done. This was further taken for, to a step ahead, where Dennis classified the whole spinal column into three columns, stating them into anterior, middle, and posterior column, giving equal importance to them. However, the most important column here was mentioned to define the stability was middle column, where any fracture or breach in continuity of middle column was said to be making a fracture more unstable, requiring surgical stabilization. Now, Dennis classification is the, is the most extensive one that we have studied in our, in our conventional teaching programs, that the Dennis classification based on the type of morphology of fracture and the mechanism of injury, depending on the pivot of, of actual loading, it has decided divided fractures into four different types, compression fracture, burst fracture, flexion distraction, and fracture dislocation. Compression fractures are the ones where the, the pivot of injury lies in the anterior half of the vertebral body and results into fracture. The burst fracture, the one where anterior and middle both are, are broken. And also the pivot is in the axial loading in the middle of the vertebral body. Whereas flexion distraction is one where the pivot of or the mechanism of injury involves the, the whole translation or the, or the whole 
flexion, uh, the, the point of pivot of rotation lies anterior to the vertebral body, resulting into the tension band posteriorly breaking off along with the anterior morphological fracture there. And fracture dislocation is one where there is a translation of one fracture of uh, the proximal fragment from the distal either in the coronal plane or in the sagittal plane, resulting into the dislocation part. And this was one of the most beautiful concepts that we have all come across and we all know that this is the most simplistic classification, so easy to remember and it almost covers almost all the fractures there. The downside of this fracture is that on one hand it describes all the fractures on the other hand it doesn't really give you a definition whether the burst fractures which ones are stable and which ones are unstable and also it doesn't really involves anything about neurology and McAfee further divided the confusion of dividing the burst fractures into stable burst fractures and unstable burst fractures depending on the height reduction of the injured injured vertebral body however both these classification systems, including the Magrel, the Dennis and McAfee classification, on one hand where they are too simplified, on the other hand never involved or gave any consideration to neurology and there were no clinical recommendations to telling us about which fractures will require surgery and which ones can be managed conservatively. The unfortunate part was there was absolutely no correlation of a description of the type of fracture morphology to the type of stability and they do not really prognosticate the neurological recovery. And based on these downsides, the efforts probably either they have not been really appreciated or probably have not been so complete or comprehensive. And that is why the intra-observer reproducibility of results using this class of systems have been extremely poor. And that's why came up the efforts of modern classing systems that are really rampant today used there. So what are these new classing systems and how are they different? There are three different types because they answer the clinical questions that we come across in day-to-day -day practice. That's thoracolumbar injury, severity score, or telix classification, AO classification systems, and load sharing classification. Let's go by them one by one to see how they are more beneficial than the conventional classification systems. So thoracolumbar injury CVRT score is a, is a classification which not only gives due weightage to the morphology described by Dennis, whether a particular type of fracture is a compression, distraction or a dislocation type of fracture and giving a specific point to a particular type of morphology of the fracture. But due importance for the first time was given to the posterior ligamentous injury and this posterior ligamentous injury was decided into whether it was intact or disrupted and this is something that carried so much more weightage stating that all patients wherever there is a posterior ligamentous complex injury will be falling into highly unstable zone and requiring a surgical intervention and this is the time where objective classifications were based objective pointing scoring was done for these patients this was the first time when neurology gained some importance into classifying these fractures and neurology was divided into complete incomplete and whether it's a root injury now depending on the type of morphology whether the PLC is intact or disrupted and whether the patient has a neurologist is complete or incomplete, different uh, points were given to different type of fractures. In every patient, a pointing a scoring is done. And if the score is above six, a patient classifies or validates to undergo a surgical intervention, whereas the patient who has a score less than eight or less than six will be probably be conserved a better deal dealt with by non-surgical modalities. Like in this particular patient, where we know that the patient's PLC is injured, however, neurology is intact. On one hand, we see it's a wedge compression type of fracture. However, However, the moment we see the posterior half of the MRI and the X-ray, we see that there is a posterior ligamentous complex that is injured, stating that this is one of the most highly unstable fractures. And if you don't treat them surgically, then in these situations, post-traumatic kyphosis may happen. So on one hand, neurology is normal. On the other hand, because of disruption of posterior ligamentous complex, the TLIC score falls into a higher scoring system. And that's why surgery is recommended in these patients to prevent further instability from going in. And that's why uh, the, the surgical decision is not made purely only based only on the morphology of the fracture but due importance is given to the posterior ligamentous complex also on the other hand a patient of this type where there is a complete paraplegia and the plc is intact the morphology is type of burst the telix score is less than six and surgery is not going to be really of any help despite neurology being in complete range surgery is not recommended in these patients as per the scoring system and this has been validated and reproducibility of this classification system is extremely high Another case example showing how scoring system can help you to understand that surgery is going to be of value for these particular patients, giving you an answer when to operate and whom to operate and the ones which can be managed conservatively and non-surgically. So TLIS classification has its own advantage that it can validate the indications of surgery in confusing situations. It has an excellent validation to prognosis as it can really guide you through the, the mechanical instability of these patients and patients with higher scores have poor prognosis requiring more surgical intervention and aggression of treatment uh, at the beginning. And neurology and morphology both are given due more weightage along with the posterior ligamentous complex in deciding whether to do surgery or conservative treatment would be of more, more validation in these patients. 
Now the problems of these classic systems was that it is that the PLC on one hand is given due importance on the other hand it is based on MRI based evaluation of the posterior ligament is complex injury and the problem with that is that it is not very uh, uh, sensitive. Fifty two percent of times it was said that the PLC injuries cannot be really diagnosed on, on only based on MRI and that's why the inter observer variation and also intra observer variation can really be varying and that's why the reproducibility of deciding on the PLC injury is, is very wide. Also, the questions like whether long segment or short segment and whether to decompression or not, were not really available from this particular classification system. It was not only oversimplification, but also the reproducibility was questioned in, late, in this last decade. The MRI-based pointing system of PLC injury has been questioned lately, stating that MRI is poorly specific in diagnosing PLC injury. With, and plus, the availability of MRI or getting feasibility of MRI in all the centers is always been questioned. Also, many subtle injuries and com more complex injuries uh, were not given any due importance based on TLS classification. And that's the job that was taken up by AO classification, which not only uh, take, took the, the efforts of magnetic and Dennis and also TLS classification gave due importance to PLC injuries but also added on the marking system for neurology and added also certain modifiers like M1 and M2. Let's go by them one by one. Now type A, B and C was a simplification of the type of morphology of the fracture whether it's a compression type fracture whether it's a distraction fracture where PLC is injured or whether it's a translation or dislocation type of fracture where PLC is ruptured and there is a translation coronal societal pain. And PLC, whether it's a transosseous or a transligamentous breach was again diagnosed on CT-based criteria and neurology was given pointing whether it's a completely intact neurology or it's a root injury or a complete injury. And the more severe form get higher pointing system. Based on this, the marking was done and again, a scoring system created deciding upon whether the surgery is validated in these patients or not. Again, subtype of these fractures was done. However, broadly, they were classified into type A, B, and C based on whether the PLC is injured or preserved and whether there is rotation translation or not. In patients where there is PLC preserved and there is no rotation translation, it is type A. Whereas in patients where there is PLC injured, you see the posterior column, whether it is transosseous or it is transligamentous, you decide whether the PLC is gone and they are type B. And if there is, along with PLC rupture, there is a translation coronal segment, they are type C. These are the most unstable kind of character uh, of fractures and they often require fixation. Neurology, again, whether intact or complete based on this and modifiers like ankylosing spine dish or posterior were added into these classing systems, further giving more validation and considering all the comprehensive features of deciding and taking into consideration whether surgery is going to be of help in this. And this was one of the most comprehensive classification system, which gave recommendation that type A are the most stable ones and often do not require fixation unless there is a neurological involvement in these particular type of patients. However, in type B, where there is a PLC injury, irrespective of the neurology of the patient, uh, surgery is validated and recommended to restore the posterior tension band. And in patients with type C, where there is dislocation, these are surgical emergencies and they are grossly unstable and always, always should be tackled in emergency scenarios. And these are the recommendations from AO group that have come across. And this was very advantage on the one hand it was complex to remember however because of being categorized into three different categories it's a it's a very it's comprehensive classification and can give you a differentiation not only based on morphology but also gives you excellent prognosis about a particular kind of stability of the fracture and being ct based classing system they are easily available at various centers and the reproducibility of these classing systems is extremely high now the question comes when do we go anterior and when do we go short and long this classification and uh, most of these classifications do not answer this particular question. When is anterior reconstruction required or when do you really have to go and reconstruct the anterior unstable fractured morphological segment of the vertebral body which is fractured? The answer to this was given by load sharing classification which further went and studied the complexities of the morphology of the vertebral body fracture based on three pointing systems called communication. How badly is the communication of the vertebral body? How much is the kyphosis at the time of fracture and how deeply the spread of the fragments and based on this it was decided if there is extreme combination more than 30 degree kyphosis or the spread of fragment is more than 2 millimeter from the original margins of the fracture of the body then anterior reconstruction should be done because if, if anterior reconstruction is not then these patients will often tend to uh, have a lesion of implant or a post-traumatic kyphosis can ensue in these particular type of patients and this uh, classification gave us a further objectification saying that any patient who has a gross combination or more than 2 millimeter spread of the of the community fragments there and more than 9 degree kyphosis there uh, or correction then these are the patients where the scoring system more than 6 result into uh, stating the highly unstable ones and they are more prone to develop pseudoarthrosis and implant failure and that's why anterior surgery is recommended in these patients. Just one case example where anterior surgery was done based on uh, uh, the scoring system. 
and whether to do anterior approach or posterior approach for anterior reconstruction is a completely surgeon based criteria however what's important is that anterior reconstruction should be done in patients wherever this load sharing classification tells you that the points are more than 6 so to summarize uh, old classification systems have always contributed to the column column concepts and understanding of the fractures however they were too simplistic and not comprehensive enough the reproducibility and validity was not so good and intra observer validation was very variable and that is why modern classification systems came into vogue and they reflect upon the contribution of column concepts about the stability of fractures posterior ligamentous complex is the one decisive element that decides about the stability of the fracture and not the only part which lies anteriorly neurology morphology and modifiers are important to be taken into clinical decision making about stability of the fractures and they should be given due consideration uh, ao classification is one which considers all these three factors uh, fracture comminution and kyphosis is, should be taken into consideration when you are doing a surgical reconstruction to decide when to do anterior reconstruction in these patients thank you so much over to you dr ramtega sir thank you very much vishal for an excellent presentation i request you to stop sharing your screen uh, we go to the next part which is a video presentation of a thoracolumbar fracture and i would be making that presentation i hope you guys can see it uh is it visible sure 50 year old gentleman bima traumatic paraplegia with bladder ball involvement neurologically shut down both lower limbs presented with the following imaging lateral views showing a fracture of l1 and d11 more critically evaluated on mr showing significant compression at d11 more so at l1 patient counseled for surgery no recovery promised prone position general anesthesia fracture palpated level confirmed long vertical incision hemostasis preoperative selen adrenaline optional i occasionally use it and as injury leads us to lumbar pedicle screw insertion having dissected the area for the lumbar pedicle the transverse process the facet joint identified point of entry the force nucleus pedicle point identified using a pedicle probe after nibbling the point of entry radiologically confirmed using a c arm image intensifier final distance right up to the anterior cortex traversed confirmed using a ball tipped probe do not be too aggressive or you will break the anterior cortex confirm the length the first crew giving us an idea in this case it was the lumbar screw 45 mm tap confirming the integrity of the pedicle throughout getting a feedback as you tap within having tapped up to 30 to 35 mm reconfirm the integrity of the pedicular hole using the ball tip probe anterior medial lateral superior inferior having confirmed and seeing the gush of back flow of blood use the screw in this particular case a 6 mm diameter 45 mm length mono axial screw we may at times use polys especially if there are deformed spines trauma i personally prefer monos having confirmed the screw length we go to the opposite side i stay on the left side of the patient and do the surgery throughout from the left side nibbling the opposite point of entry the mammillary process if identified in the lumbar spine good point get in with the pedicular probe 
you may use something like a curved probe or a straight probe personal choice same steps get in with your ball tipped confirm the length on image intensifier go all the way in integrity of the pedicle to be maintained tap all the way in different tap lengths available most have a 30 or a 35 millimeter threaded portion at times you have to have a critical dorsal lumbar junctional pedicle where the point of entry is transitional between the thoracic points and the lumbar points as was in this d12 pedicle we had gone into l2 l3 below and now are addressing the d12 as we have a fracture above and below this on D11 and L1. Identifying both the left and the right, going into the left pedicle first, cancellous backflow and ooze identified at the point of entry becomes the hill of the transverse process. The valley of the lamina becomes the hill of the transverse process. The junction of the valley and the hill at the superior most edge of the lamina is nibbled, cancellous ooze seen there, and your pedicular probe with suitable direction put in. Thoracic pedicles are in the upper one third of the vertebral body and tend to go slightly downward. An anterior posterior view is a much better view in the thoracic spine than. The lateral view which is very very useful in the lumbar spine same steps now the ball tipped in length verified moving to the opposite side to show you the steps nibbling of the area between the valley and the hill the lamina and the transverse process getting your markers for the other screws you could use Kirshner wires or candlesticks, which are covered Kirshner wires, and go through the same process of particular probe, sounding it with a ball tipped, tapping, and finally putting your screw in. A French bender. Use the rod, which in most cases is a 5.5 millimeter rod, titanium. Contour it suitably such that it takes care of the ideal thoracolumbar junction. Place the lumbar screws within the rod, get the locking nut in, gently use a rod reducer which will get the rod into the thoracic screws and lock the thoracic screws in. You may use a little bit of bone wax at the tip of the locking screw so that you can hold it well with the screwdriver. Most critical part of the operation, decompression of the theca. This particular patient, unfortunately, neurologically totally shut down, but in the incomplete neurology, a very, very critical part, if you are hoping that it would help the patient neurologically as well. Never promise it, but hope for it. Large retropulse fragment, gradually nibbled out, remaining lateral to the theca. I tend to do my decompression, keeping my midline intact for some time because it keeps me away from the theca and keeps me away from accidentally retracting the dural elements, which are critical. You may gently insinuate an L punch, as I am trying to do here, and push the retropulsed fragment as much anteriorly as you can. Gently, after identifying where your L punch is, put the punch in, and punch the fragment anteriorly. This is hoping to directly decompress in addition to the indirect decompression that the screw and rods may have achieved. Here you would notice the theca now falling free and 
a good comfortable insinuation of the L punch anterior to the theca, pushing the retropulse fragments more anteriorly. This is a direct decompression from a posterior approach, but remaining as lateral as you can. Notice where the L punch has gone and pushed that retropulse fragment completely. Smaller fragments, which may still be coming anteriorly and hurting the dura, may be physically removed from that key to this construct. Various forms of transverse connectors available. This is the most simple and conventional one, where you slide in a rod and put in two locking screws to complete the assembly. A final gentle wash, confirmation of the position radiologically of the screws and the rods and the construct, post-operative x-rays, post-operative CT scans showing good decompression, good screw placement, adequate length, good direction. Recap. Thank you, guys. Um, that was the presentation. I have actually cut down a 15-minute video to a 10-minute video. And I would be happy to take questions later. May I invite Tim Moore to share his video on his technique to reduce a thoracolumbar lumbar dislocation. Tim, all yours. Thank you, Ram. Excellent talk. Um, let me pull up my presentation. Can everyone see that? Not yet, Tim. Okay. You need to screen share and then... Yeah. How about now? Yes, that's fine. Great, thank you. Okay, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm very honored uh, to be with this distinguished faculty. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about thoracolumbar dislocations. Um, burst fractures, flexion distraction injuries, those types of things, um, they, uh, need to be stabilized mechanically, also decompressed. These are really bad injuries. Uh, these are thoracolumbar dislocations. Um, and I'm just going to discuss a couple of cases uh, and then show the videos of how we tend to treat these. So this is a 38-year-old male fall from 40 feet. So the LD50 for falls is, uh, is 40 feet. So 50% of people who fall from a height of 40 feet die of their injuries. He was hemodynamically labile. Uh, he was uh, in distress, uh, low blood pressure, high heart rate. So hemodynamically unstable, zero out of five bilateral lower extremities, um, no rectal tone. So this is his sagittal CT scan. So um, actually when I had this up in the operating room, the anesthesiologist thought this, this was a miss missile injury. So he thought this was a combat injury. But in Cleveland, Ohio, we don't have a lot of combat other than fighting walleye in Lake Erie. So this was his sagittal CT scan, T12 uh, and T11, just complete comminution. So this is an axial CT scan with the uh, burst culprit fragment uh, actually expulsed through the lamina. So this is actually the posterior vertebral body, and this is what we saw when we initially dissected deep to the fascia. So again, another um, axial showing, th these are C-type injuries. These are massive neurologic injuries, a massive, these are almost like internal amputations. So this is an intraoperative uh, picture. So this is uh, what was left of his shredded spinal cord more on the right side. This is um, not a ray tech, but a, a large lap sponge. And this was one of three that was packed anteriorly to the spine. So I, I showed this picture in this case because you have to be very, very careful with these types of injuries. These injuries uh, 
require uh, large dissections, but can involve massive blood loss. So typically what we do is we don't make an incision from stem to stern here. Um, we, we do a cranial incision towards the cranial end of our instrumentation, and then we put our pedicle screws in at the cranial end. We make a more caudal incision and put our screws in here. And then once we have most of our instrumentation intact and, and uh, completed, then we open up uh, the middle here and we try to be extremely efficient in realigning the spine, stabilizing the spine. You're not going to help uh, this patient from a neurologic standpoint. So this isn't something you just dive into in the middle of the night at two o'clock in the morning. Again, complete disruption of the neurologic elements. You're not going to help this patient significantly from a neuro neurologic standpoint, but you got to think we want to get this patient stabilized and onto our rehab as soon as possible. But again, you have to think about the mechanism and the energy of these injuries, and you have to be extremely careful. Uh, with these massive high energy uh, fracture dislocations. The next case is a 20 year old male car versus snowmobile. Unfortunately, our patient was in the snowmobile weakness in bilateral lower extremities. He had three out of five hip flexion, zero out of five below that with no rectal tone. So this is his sagittal uh, CT scan once again. Um, so you see a significant axial shift. I always uh, teach the residents and the fellows, beware of axial shifts in, in the spine. It usually means significant neurologic injury, but you have a significant axial shift between T12 and L1 with a fracture off the anterior end plate of L1. So again, just uh, another sagittal CT scan, which shows dislocation of the T12 L1 facets. This bony relationship should be back here as we all can see that. So a fracture of the T12, uh, I'm sorry, of the L1 anterior vertebral body with a dislocation. So an AO type C injury with likely uh, complete neurologic deficit. So this is an axial CT scan and a sign that we coined uh, it looks like a tree. So, so a tree sign where you have dislocation of the um, uh, uh, superior articular facets with the inferior articular facets, just pathognomonic, pathognomonic of a dislocation. So uh, this is how we, we've learned to reduce these types of injuries. So as we look at the screen, cranial is to the left, caudal is to the right. Um, we've inserted our pedicle screws above the level of the injury um, and our pedicle screws below the level of the injury. And we've placed uh, transverse rods at T12 to, to include the T12 pedicle screws and also at the L1 pedicle screws. What you see here, we'll let the video play a little bit. Um, what you see here are the superior articular facets of L1. So this isn't something you should see immediately once you dissect at a thoracal lumbar trauma. So this shows a complete dislocation of T12 and L1. So just like any other fracture dislocation, you want to exaggerate the um, moment of dislocation. So longitudinal traction works. And what, what, What's nice about this, it, it allows you to control the proximal fragment of the dislocation and the distal fragment of the dislocation. So that's what's nice about these transverse rods. You can put these large vice grip uh, clamps because I was taught as a resident and a fellow to just burr down these facets. Just take these facets down and then it's easy to re reduce the dislocation. But that's not a significant... Uh, um, you're taking an unstable injury, a dislocation, and you're creating a more unstable situation by burring down the facets. So uh, what's nice about this is you can maintain uh, the normal anatomy and reduce the dislocation predictably by this transverse rod technique. So these are the, um, and the initial uh, uh, publication, these are the eight patients that we uh, did as a workup we're up to about 30, 
to 33 patients now. Um, you're not of note, you are not going to improve the neurologic status in an Asia A type of injury. That's not the goal of this technique. The goal of this technique is to uh, predictably reduce dislocations um, without uh, removing a lot of the bony anatomy. Therefore, um, and this is this is a postoperative lateral X-ray which shows pedicle screws two above and two below the dislocation. Um, and tor what we're doing now is actually just uh, oftentimes doing instrumentation at the level uh, of the cranial dislocated joint and the and the caudal dislocated joint. So oftentimes you can minimize fusion levels, um, and oftentimes in the thoracolumbar lumbar spine, that's a fairly uh, significant uh, point. So the, the, the last case I want to show you is a 19-year-old male, high-speed MVC, ejected. He has weakness in his bilateral distal lower extremities. He has three out of five knee flexion and knee extension, but zero out of five uh, distally to that and dorsiflexion, EHL, and plantar flexion. Diminished rectal tone with patchy sensation. So I consider this an incomplete injury uh, at, the, um, at this level. So this again is his sagittal CT scan. You see traumatic spondyloptosis, uh, fracture dislocation of L3 on L4. So this can be a surgical dilemma. So this is a high energy injury. And the first thing that you should consider with something like this is, is there a vascular injury in this patient? So you wanna make sure that you don't dive in on this immediately when the patient presents uh, uh, to your trauma center or your emergency department, but you want to make sure you check the ABCs uh, as you do with any other trauma patient. So you want to make sure that the vascularity uh, to the distal, to the pelvis and the lower extremities is maintained. So again, just uh, other sagittal picks. So an axial pick, uh, you know, this is a bad sign when you see two vertebral bodies in the same axial pick. So you got to think about we're not, we're likely not going to improve this patient's neurologic status. However, we wanna get the patient reduced as soon as possible, but hemodynamics uh, predominate over this. So this is just a, a, a CT uh, uh, 3D reconstruction, which shows the L3 vertebral body anterior to the L4 vertebral body. You have a fracture of the L4 superior end plate here. And then I go back, I teach residents and fellows to go back to your orthopedic principles. It's a fracture dislocation. So what can help in this instance is what? Longitudinal traction. So as you can see, we are in an operating room. The patient is intubated, sedated. There's a large bolster at the fulcrum of the injury. What's important here though, is the patient is supine. So the patient is being monitored from hemodynamics. So the patient is relaxed, supine with longitudinal traction. If his blood pressure tanks and drops out, we have easy, we, I say our vascular surgeons have easy access to his belly, but we are in a controlled environment. If I roll this patient, if I roll this patient prone, I still have a surgical dilemma of uh, stabilizing the traumatic spondyloptosis. But if you, again, go back to your orthopedic uh, principles, traction works, traction works, especially for dislocations. So this is a fluoroscopy view uh, uh, that we got in a supine position. So we got this in a more manageable position in terms of a, a stabilizing from, uh, from surgery. And then we roll the patient prone on our Jackson table. We try to maintain the reduction we got. And then this is his prone fluoroscopy view. So this I can manage. I can, I can use my instrumentation and somewhat reduce this, but I can't manage this fracture if the patient is prone with L L3 in front of the L4 vertebral body. So this is just an intraoperative picture. It was like a gill laminectomy. The L3 um, lamina and spinous process came off in one piece. There was no dirt, 
dural uh, violation. The L3 uh, nerve roots were pinched off and uh, traumatically um, lacerated. And then this is the alignment that we got uh, with the patient on the table. Um, I chose not to instrument L3 because we had to reduce things. So we instrumented L1, L2, we skipped L3 and instrumented L4 and L5. So that's how we tend to deal with uh, bad um, uh, traumatic uh, thoracolumbar fracture and dislocations. Um, I'll stop sharing and go back to Ram now. Thank you very much, Tim. That was an excellent presentation, novel techniques, and extending your orthopedic training to these difficult spine situations. Uh, any question you would like to ask Vishal, or should we move on to cervical spine? No, I think I'm good. I'm good. So this was very interesting to see the novel technique of reduction, particularly thoracolumbar spine, the transverse bar. It's very interesting. Tim, any additional comments by the time I share my screen to go to the cervical spine section? Any additional comments? No, I, uh, Vishal, it's, it's great. It's a great talk. Every time I, I think I have the classification of uh, thoracolumbar injuries figured out, uh, I hear a talk from someone like you and I learn a little bit more. Ram, um, your, your technique video is uh, fantastic. I, I want to come and scrub with you to, to, to learn more. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Uh, can you see my first slide? Yes. Subaxial yes. cervical spine injuries, the role of six classification. I'm just going to run through how we look at cervical spine injuries today. An ideal classification system should be easy to understand, reproducible, should be easy to diagnose based on the pattern of injury, easy to compare all treatment results, and broadly tell us when to operate, when not to operate, and if operate, whether to go from the front, the rear, or both. We've had a plethora of classifications over the years, from the Allen Ferguson, 1982, to the Slicks classification in 2006. The fact that we've gone through this entire gamut of distraction, distraction extension, 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 compression, compression, flexion, compression, flexion, distraction, flexion, means that we went from an anatomic injury-based biomechanics to incorporate indirectly the neurology and try to look at the quantum and the type of injury to classify what we saw. However, whatever we call them, there were exceptions and outliers. We tried our best to look at not just the lateral view, but also the anteroposterior and the axial views using x-rays and CT scans. And then the MRI came in and we started paying more attention to the neurology. But the CT and x-ray still remain extremely critical and important in classification and planning of these injuries. Please understand asymmetry on an anteroposterior view is critical and tells us whether there is a one-sided neurology and whether there is something we have to go back and look at as far as a rotary displacement is concerned. We also need to understand that not all cervical spine injuries can be blindly be put on traction. Please understand there are certain injuries, distractive flexion, distractive extension of few types, which if you apply unsupervised traction, you may be adding further insult to the injury. Please understand, in a distractive extension, there's a failure of the anterior complex, a retrolisthesis and a widening of the disc space in front. Not very common, but seen. Again, in this injury as well, you have to be very cautious in not over-distracting. Clay shovelers is one thing which we all pick up, but they are associated with other injuries rather than be isolated. So keep your eyes open not to miss out anything. Then came the AO classification, but then it was very generic. A was axial loading, compression, B was a bending type, and C was circumferential. And as we went from A to C, the quantum of injury became worse. 
neurology still could not be added. Finally, in 2006, Alex Vaccaro tried to get injury morphology, disco ligamentous complex stability, and neurological status together, giving one score. And as the score increased, the chances of needing surgery went up. Morphology, he looked for no abnormality on x-rays or CT. He looked for a compression, a burst, one or two. Distraction, which was even more, three points. And rotation and translation, which was four points. Disco ligamentous complex was something you looked for on an MRI. Intactness, no points. Not too sure, one. Disrupted, two. We combined CT and MR for most of these. Neurological status, if there is intactness, no score. If there's an isolated root injury, let's say the C6 or the C7 nerve root, one. Complete neurology, two. Incomplete neurology, and that's the interesting part. It got a higher score of three because it's the incomplete neurology that actually needs urgent attention. And if there is a pre-existing continuous cord compression, which may be adding to the neurology, you get an additional one point. Injuring morphology, plain x-rays and CT were taken in, but MR is obviously more helpful and we now combine all three. So compression, distraction, translation, rotation. Disco ligamentous complex, as I said, Disrupted two points, indeterminate one, intact zero. Disruption, articular apposition more than 50% or a diastasis two millimeters or more. Neurology, as I said, root injury being bare minimum, complete cord injury being next, and incomplete cord injury getting maximum points. Ongoing spinal cord compression, an additional rider which adds to insult and would probably precipitate the need for surgical intervention. So decision-making, zero to three points, no surgery. Five upwards, absolute surgery. Four, depending on the surgeon preference and the extenuating circumstances. To this was added Borax treatment algorithm. And he looked at a systemic review of literature and also found that there were various approaches anterior and posterior. And he realized and he shared with us that compression and burst injuries are more commonly treated anteriorly in a single stage, while translational and rotational injuries are more commonly treated posteriorly or combined AP. Let's look at our first case scenario. A 32-year-old man with a C67 unilateral dislocation. That means there is a rotational injury, four points. Look at the posterior ligamentous complex. It's disrupted. There's no indeterminate. It's surely disrupted, two points. And there is a nerve root injury, C7. So it's four plus two plus one, seven needing surgery. Second, 27-year-old woman, Incomplete neurology, it's a translational injury, disrupted posterior ligaments complex, incomplete neurology, so four plus two plus three, nine surgical. Let's look at this 19 year old woman, C7 burst, compression burst, two points, intact DLC. Well, CT, if you had an MR, that would also show the same, neurologically intact, so just two points up to three points, no surgery. Interesting fourth case, and look at the MRI here. 60-year-old woman, cervical spondylosis, presenting with acute central cord. No injury morphology on plane images or on CT, no points. No disco ligamentous complex injury, absolutely no points. Incomplete neurology, central cord, three points, and existing ongoing spinal cord compression, that additional rider, one more point, 
So I would probably look at surgery in this woman if she's willing and fit for the same. So four points is a call which the surgeon takes based on the availability and that particular extraneous symptoms or signs of the patient. Let's run through a few of our patients. This is a C3 burst with a two over three injury. What did we do here? We went in and did it purely anterior. Most of these injuries can be done anteriorly. What did we do in this, which was like a bifacetal, not getting reduced, went in from the front and reduced it. This was a combination of a front soft tissue and a back and front injury. We went in purely from the front and used a spacer and not a bone graft in this patient. This is a multi-level pathology where there was a two-level instability, had to do a corpectomy, remove that disc fragment and that bone and injured at two levels. A similar injury, but better quality bone, injury mainly discal. So the other option where we spared the bone in between and did two spacers. This is very interesting where we were able to get a reduction and went in and stabilized this patient differently from the others. This patient, incomplete, irreducible, despite most efforts, so had to go and combine it and did a purely posterior surgery and got a good reduction and was able to maintain it with a posterior rupture. This is where we thought we'd probably have to do more than just go in from the front because it was irreducible. So did a small surgery from the rear, did a small facetectomy, did a small posterior surgery, flipped a patient over and did an anterior surgery. This is 16 years back. I would probably do a similar surgery with a different set of implants today. Finally, in summary, Optimal diagnostic and treatment part of a cervical injury is always problematic. Decisions are based on classification systems and evidence, as well as training, personal preference, and patient-related factors. Remember that the slick recommendations represent the developer, that is Vaccaro and teams, evidence-based rationale, preferences, and experience. The plans recommended and the case examples that I've given are reasonable, time-tested, diagnostic, and therapeutic. And Vorax algorithm has helped us decide anterior, posterior, or anterior plus posterior. Thank you all for a patient hearing. We learn from our patients, and this is what I've learned from them. Ubuntu, I am because we are. Thank you all for a very patient hearing. May I now call on Vishal to share screen? And tell us something more about odontoid fractures, dilemmas in decision making, which he has demystified. All yours, Vishal. Thank you, Dr. Ram. I am sure you would want to have a glass of water. It was an exhausting and yet comprehensive and complete talk on subaxial cervical spine trauma. We will change the gears and move a little more cranial towards the craniovertebral junction, where C1 and C2 are the ones which often get injured either in plain polytrauma or in association with subaxial spine injuries. And the commonest fracture in craniovertebral junction is none other than the biggest bone in that junction, that is C2. And the odontoid fractures comprise 70% of these fractures in the craniovertebral junction area. And odontoid fractures, whenever they come across, they not only pose you with multiple dilemmas about what kind of fracture it is, how to uniformize treatment? Is there a way to classify these fractures? And is there a guideline on management which fracture to operate? And how do we operate these fractures, whether we do by anterior approach, osteosynthesis, or posterior C1, C2 fixation? And when actually do we conserve these patients? And what are the techniques and methods for conserving, uh, conserving these fractures? So to summarize the talk that I'm going to come up in a few slides now, there are only eight carry-on messages from the coming slides. Number one, odontoid fractures are commonly missed and misdiagnosed injuries. Unless until you have high index of suspicion, you will often miss these because these often happen in patients with polytrauma, which are not often checked upon normal x-ray and often they may be diagnosed at a later date. So 
be highly highly suspicious about these fractures not all odontoid fractures are unstable there are classification systems to tell you which fracture is stable and which is unstable and type 2 odontoid fractures which are displaced are the ones which have a highest tendency of going to non union and are termed as the most unstable ones requiring surgery however despite that not all unstable fractures require surgery because more often than not hollow waste or fibrous non union particularly elderly patient can also be seen as a acceptable standard of care and not all require surgery anterior osteosynthesis still remains the gold standard whenever possible anterior odontoid screw fixation should be done however posterior fixation is the choice in more than 50% of cases because contraindications list of anterior fixation is big and when to do anterior when to do posterior fracture morphology age combination of the fracture helps us in deciding which cases will be amenable to anterior and which one will be amenable to posterior so let's just go by these messages one by one i'll bring out cases to prove the worth of these messages across 37 year old male conscious and oriented comes to your emergency room after a polytrauma due to blunt injury and also has abdominal injury also gets some neck pain but all the four limbs are moving neurology is normal and x ray shows of cervical spine that it is nothing severe that happening around there unfortunately it's only after 2 weeks when the patient is shifted to the wards after surgical care from high surgical unit that's when we know that his neck pain is persistent and a repeat x ray was done to see and a ct scan done to see that there is a undisplaced odontoid fracture there and this kind of uh, missed diagnosis of odontoid fracture is not uncommon and in fact is very common in pediatric age group particularly in kids who have a minor trivial neck fall at at school and complain only of some subtle neck pain after this fall and these kids often tend to come to you with either mal union non union or displaced rotator fractures or rotator subluxations at a very later date unless you have a very high index of suspicion so to carry home the messages that odontoid fractures often are not displaced to begin with and that is why they often get missed you need to keep a very high index of suspicion in every single patient of neck trauma polytrauma particularly those who are disoriented in patients who are elderly and in patients with kids remember odontoid fractures and craniovertebral junction fractures often do not come with either deformity of torticollis or with neurological deterioration and these patients the only presenting symptom may be subtle neck pain so if a pain persists for more than 3 to 5 days go ahead and do advanced investigations you may find some surprises in the form of hidden fractures out there have a very high index of suspicion now the when you see fractures of this kind either on x ray or a ct scan the question comes what next now these are fractures which have hardly 1 mm displacement is this a stable fracture or is it a unstable fracture a fracture line which starts in the tip of odontoid goes down to the body how do we classify them is this the fracture which is going to get displaced in mere, in mere time or not whether non operative treatment should be chosen these young patients or operative is the only way to go are there ways and means to guide us about the clinical management so this the answer comes from various classification systems that are available anderson alonzo's classification gives us a beautiful description based on the location of the fracture line the ones which are in the peg of odontoid are called type 1 they are relatively rare the type 2 ones are the ones which are involved at the base of the peg of odontoid these are the fractures which constitute maximum the most common ones and the type 3 are the ones where the fracture line runs from the odontoid into the vertebral body or the c2 body result to be called as type 3 it is also said in this classification that the ones which are undisplaced or less than 1 mm displacement of these fractures are called stable and the ones which are displaced can be termed as unstable fractures these not only ascertain the natural history but also formally uh, guide you through some basic rules of management stating that stable fractures in zone 1 or type 1 fracture should not be treated by surgical measures in fact they should be left alone only by soft immobilization whereas unstable fractures or the displaced ones particularly in type 2 are highly amenable to non union and that's why should be observed cleanly to see if there is any non union happening and then surgery should be continued and if they are displaced to begin with surgery should be contemplated in these patients right at the beginning so to summarize classification systems help you in not only classifying these fractures uniformizing the communication but also in evaluating the stability of these fractures and undisplaced fractures can often be managed non surgically be it type 1 type 2 or type 3 they should be observed however displaced fractures particularly in zone 2 or type 2 type 2 fractures should be managed surgically in all cases now the problem with these classifications was that there is significant amount of inter observer variation 
like this particular fracture line which goes from the zone 2 to type to extending into the body can sometimes be classified as type 2 and sometimes can also be classified as type 3 and that's why the confusion or the gray line becomes broader stating that there is no exact clue of management of these fractures moreover it is also said that management of type 2 fractures uh, which have a very high uh, non union rate often may end up into aad and that is why rigid anterior osteosynthesis should be done whereas type 3 fractures may unite by themselves so these uh, fractures actually it said that the, the fracture line cannot be the only deciding factor in deciding whether surgery should be done or not and it is often emphasized that a generic uh, there are multiple relevant factors like bone mineral density physiological age rather than chronological age, and comorbidity and type of fracture line and angulation that also must be taken into consideration whenever you are planning to do surgery in these patients and all these factors were then taken into consideration in grewers classification system stating the disadvantage of anderson alonzo where only morphology or the type of fracture line was taken into consideration whereas grewer mentioned that only one factor of the fracture cannot be considered into surgical management plans or clinical management plan and that is why all these factors should be given due importance <clears throat> whether the patient is young or elderly whether there is displacement of fracture whether there is communication of the fracture what is the angle reverse oblique or straight or transverse line of the fracture and if there are any associated injuries and unless you are taken into consideration all these factors into consideration any classification system cannot be said to be comprehensive and complete and helping us in guideline of the management so now the current recommendations are type 1 fractures immobilized with soft cervical collar type 2 fractures immobilized with halo unless they are displaced type 3 again immobilize them unless they are displaced how, and in fact, now there are guidelines to say that particularly in elderly patients, halo waist immobilization really works well, particularly elderly patients where a fibrous union can be considered as a standard of care. So only in displaced fractures is where surgery is recommended, particularly in type 2 patients. So to summarize, management planning is based on not only the morphology or type of fracture or the fracture line or location of fracture, but multiple factors that to be taken into consideration where is the fracture line, what kind of fracture it is, whether it is stable, unstable, whether it is displaced, undisplaced, what is the type of osteoporosis that you're dealing with, whether what is the combination of the fracture and what is the age of the patient. And all these factors must be taken into consideration when deciding a particular kind of treatment option for this kind of patient. Now, you have decided that these are displaced type 2 fractures which require surgical intervention. The biggest question comes when to do anterior and when to do posterior. We all know that anterior osteosynthesis by anterior screw fixation is still the gold standard because it spares the C1-C2 joint, has highest fusion rates and is technically simple and cost effective. Like in this particular patient, as we saw in case 1, where mild displaced fracture in a young patient with polytrauma, a anterior screw synthesis was done. <clears throat> and that still remains the gold standard and we must always try to preserve the C1-C2 joint, try to have anterior screw fixation whenever is possible. However, the problems come to, and to the picture when we know that anterior osteosynthesis doesn't always work though it's a gold standard in fixation however failing anterior fixations are not uncommon and we often see that these screws are either not working or failing more often than what we consider them and despite being gold standard there are certain case scenarios where anterior screws will not work so can we really know when will it not work yes the list of contraindications where anterior screws either are going to fail can be caught upon very early by knowing the list of these contraindications. To summarize them, the anterior ordinate screw is not always possible and you can actually pick upon when anterior screw is going to fail. To divide them, when is anterior screw going to fail? We can say that odontoid fractures have either a favorable anatomy for anterior screw or an unfavorable anatomy for an anterior screw. Favorable anatomy is where the fracture line is transverse or oblique where you will get the lag screw principle of this. Like you see the fracture line here, as was mentioned in Grewer's classification. Only these kind of fractures are amenable to anterior screw fixation. And all the other ones will probably not be amenable to anterior screw fixation. Like in this patient, we saw anterior screw fixation for an oblique fracture line where lag screw principle compression was achieved and wonderful fusion was achieved at that level. However, displaced fractures with reverse oblique fragments, smaller proximal fragment, Combination of the proximal fragment where the hold in the proximal fragment is not going to happen. Hyperextension kind of injuries. Elderly patients or pediatric patients less than 8 years. Delayed non-unions of odontoid fractures and atypical variant with transverse ligament injury. All these are kind of fractures where anterior screw is contraindicated and these are called unfavorable anatomies where anterior screw is bound to fail if you resort to only anterior osteosynthesis and that's why posterior fixation should be resorted to them. Let me show you some case examples of these. 
reverse oblique anterior screw is bound to fail in this patient like it failed in this requiring a posterior fixation another patient with a very small proximal fragment no amount of anterior screw purchase is going to help and that's why posterior screw fixation was done and got a good solid fusion there another patient with comminuted proximal fragment and comminuted fracture wooden toid we use a navigation guided posterior transarticular screw again an anterior screw is only going to shorten and result into failure of anterior osteosynthesis another patient with osteoporosis of the proximal fragment uh, posterior is the way to go in these patients pediatric patients or patients with delayed union or delayed non union again these are the patients where anterior screw is bound to fail and posterior screw should be considered as the primary mainstay of fixation in these patients so to summarize posterior surgery though not the primary choice is often needed in patients where anterior doesn't works and we must realize that anterior fixation though being a gold standard is not always possible in many of the times to sun <clears throat> the summary message they are commonly missed fractures you have to have high index of suspicion not all odontoid fractures are unstable as i just showed across classification systems help you to decide unstable versus stable type 2 fractures if they are di displaced they are unstable often require surgical management of course anterior is the gold standard however it is not always possible to do anterior and posterior fixation is the choice if you see that the fracture morphology is saying that anterior is not amenable way to treat these fractures thank you over to you dr ramchandra thank you vishal for an excellent complete cover of odontoid fractures may i now call upon tim tim will share a surgical exposition of posterior c1 c2 stabilization over to you tim thank you ram bishal excellent talk i i like it that um an acceptable outcome for um c2 uh, fractures is a fibrous non-union i think even if i operate on the patient I, I think I want this fracture to be stable. It, there may not be a bony union, but uh, an acceptable outcome is a fibrous non-union. So um, be, can everyone see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, great. So been doing this for a while. I've been part of, um, I was part of Henry Bowman's fellowship for the first six years of my practice. Then I've, uh, has been, I have been a part of the combined uh, Cleveland Clinic Neuro and Ortho Spine Fellowship. One of the biggest apprehensions that fellows have coming to a fellowship year. So they've completed their orthopedic or neurosurgical residency training and they get to a spine fellowship year is posterior C12 instrumentation. Um, occiput, not that big of a deal. It's a big flat bone. You can uh, place anything you want on the occiput. Um, make sure those uh, uh, screws are short. You don't want too much CSF leaking out of the head. Uh, but it's posterior, it's C12, uh, specifically la C1 lateral mass instrumentation. So we're going to go uh, through our uh, why we use this in trauma. Uh, we do a lot of posterior uh, occiput to C2 instrumentation in trauma, uh, specifically for occipital alano dissociations. The key to doing a traumatic OAD is to leave your C1 screws long. The biggest issue with this type of surgery is getting that rod to fit into the occiput plate down into the C1 tul tulips and then into the C2 screws. So this is how we like to do it. Um, we have occiput buttons out on the side, so multiple points of fixation in the occiput. These are C1 lateral mass screws and these are 40 to 42 millimeter long screws. They look horribly uh, prominent as you put them in. Always make sure you're doing this under fluoro or some type of um, image guidance. You don't want to put them in too deep because you can damage uh, the carotid artery in a certain subset of patients. But you want to keep these C1 screws extremely long because the fiddle, again, is to get your rod to meet the occiput fixation down to the C1 screws and then down into C2. So if I'm doing an occipital uh, Atlanta dissociation, I rarely ever go below C2. If they have poor anatomy or poor bone quality, but typically OAD dissociations don't have poor bone quality. But the biggest, one of the biggest errors I see in uh, treating these injuries is skipping C, the C1 lateral masses at, as a point of fixation and then not getting good fixation in C2 and wasting fusion levels below C2. So this is how we like to do uh, occipital cervical dissociations, long C1 lateral mass screws, and then 
almost a straight or a pre-contoured lordotic rod simply seats into the occiput fixation, lies in the tulips, and it's an easy point. Again, I do occiput um, cortico cancellus autograph for occipital cervical fusions. So this is a wire that we'll go over in a later video. So this is my bias in terms of occipital cervical uh, fusions and how to do them. These plates, uh, occipital plates are wonderful. They're perfect. They fit right below the inion. You got, um, um, you can get nice long screws in the keel uh, of the skull, usually 10 to 12 millimeters. But the issue with this type of fixation is, is it takes all the surface area for your fusion. So when you're dealing with an occipital cervical dissociation, the goal of that surgery is to create a fusion between the occiput and the upper cervical spine. So these plates are wonderful. They're easy to use. They're great. I like this type of fixation. I like these occipital cervical, these occip occipital buttons. They go way out to the side. No, they they don't have as great fixation into the skull. These are usually four or six millimeter screws. But what it does, it allows you this whole area here in the midline for your bony fusion. And this is an intraoperative image. It's kind of difficult to interpret, but th these are the occipital cervical buttons out to the side. We have uh, uh, cortico cancellus autographed uh, from the iliac crest here. And then we have multiple rods going up to the occiput with these other buttons over top. So just my bias in how we like to treat these types of fusions. We also use a poster C12 instrumentation for odontoid fractures. Um, if you're going to offer uh, geriatric odontoid fracture surgery, you want to be efficient and safe. They don't have the reserve. You don't want to spend four or five hours on the OR table. Um, so you've got to be comfortable with uh, C1 and C2 instrumentation. So this is uh, just a post-operative x-ray of, uh, of a recent um, type 2 odontoid fracture and a C1 ring fracture. You can see it here. This, this patient was 82. Uh, fall from uh, about two feet off of a stepladder. So you want to be extremely efficient and extremely safe. So you have to be comfortable with instrumentation of the C1 lateral masses and your options in C2. This is a cross link place between the C1 uh, lateral mass screws to control the C1 ring injury. Um, conventional and uh, uh, teaching now for upper cervical fractures C1 ring fractures where the whole lateral mass is dissociated um, off of, uh, um, it's almost like a free floating lateral mass fracture and certain types of C2 fractures, traumatic spondylolisthesis of the axis. Sometimes instead of going anteriorly and doing a C23 ACDF for those fractures, sometimes if the fracture is amenable, you can get C2 lag screws uh, through the pedicles. So you have to be adept in getting um, in C1 and C2 uh, fixation. So this is the most recent patient we did with a C1 ring fracture. This is an intraoperative uh, picture, obviously, uh, with, a, a guard, with the Mayfield apparatus. Um, longitudinal traction as the patient is a position on the table. Then we play C1 lateral mass fractures, and then we connect them with a, uh, a rod to control that C1 fracture. So... What's nice about posterior C12 fixation is that there's multiple fixation points in C2. C2 is uh, very uh, uh, kind to us as surgeons. Uh, there's multiple options for C2 fixation. My bias, I like to get C2 pedicle screws. Uh, I, I feel most comfortable with those. They're stronger. They're at, at a different trajectory than lateral mass screws. Um, they're they, very substantial. They line up very well with C1 um, lateral mass screws. If I can't get C2 pedicle screws, I like C2 PARS screws, and we'll go over that in the video. My um, last ditch, this ditch effort, or my bailout are C2 laminar screws. So if I'm looking at a sagittal CT scan and I'm thinking about instrumenting C2, I want to get three consecutive sagittal CT scan shots of safe path uh, for C2 pedicle screws. I don't do a lot of image guidance. Um, I don't do a lot of uh, live fluoroscopy 
Um, I'm kind of a big guy, can't work around the fluoroscopy. So this is one uh, uh, sagittal CT scan, safe passage uh, for a C2 pedicle screw. This is two, this is the next shot, and then this is three. You can see the vertebral artery and the transverse foramen coming up here, but this is a, a C2 PARS that I feel safe freehanding a C2 pedicle screw in. So we'll go to the video now. So the, to set up this video, this is an intraoperative video. Um, this is posterior occip, um, a posterior C1 2 fixation. This here is the midline. So this initial one, we're working on the left side. This is the C1 ring here, and then the, this is the C2 lamina. So we'll kind of talk through this as we go through. So what we're doing now is we're dissecting the Atlanta axial ligament off the bottom of the C1 ring. Um, I use a, I use a 3 micro curette or 4 micro curette. Don't offer posterior C1-2 surgery if you're afraid, if, if you are um, afraid of bleeding because it's, it's going to bleed, okay? So it's a venous bleeding, hopefully. I use a lot of small patties. You can pack these small patties up into the ring of C1 and down and um, over top the lamina of C2, because a lot of uh, fracture uh, bleeding will um, come from um, the, the canal. So dissect the ligament, the Atlanta axial ligament off the posterior elements of C1 and C2, pack these patties up into the canal of C1 as is shown here. And then we are taking the C2 nerve root here. What I like to do is we have a aquamanus uh, uh, hemostatic, uh, and then we uh, do micro scissors, and then you can I set the bovie on ten to fifteen, and you can dissect the C two um, nerve root there uh, to do the neurolysis. And then what we're doing here is we're we're in the C one two joint. So this is a curette into the C one two joint. Um, the C two nerve root has been sacrificed here. We're dissecting and we're, we're, we're removing the cartilage off the C1-2 joint. If you take the C2 nerve root, you have complete exposure of that C1-2 joint and you can take a burr. Um, you don't want to burr too much. You don't want to burr too much inferiorly on the top of the C2 uh, lateral mass as that vertebral artery can be one to two millimeters below you. So you, if you want to err, you want to err more so on, on burring more of the C1 lateral mass because it's just much safer. And what I like to do, especially if I get, if I have cranial settling of the odontoid into the frame and magnum, and I need height through C1 and C2, I use uh, an ACDF uh, corticocancellus allografts because that will push the C1 arch and the occiput up and pull the odontoid out of the frame and magnum. So just a simple technique where you can use uh, uh, modified corticocancellus allografts, um, ACDF grafts to get height through your C1, C2 lateral masses. And then we're, we are positioning our point for our C1 lateral mass screw. I like to use a marking pen and just, just mark the medial border on the C1 posterior ring here, our, our three millimeter matchstick burr um, is right at the junction of the PARS and the C1 lateral mass. You angle slightly cranially and medially. And then the key point here is, is that you don't wanna send this drill guide, you don't wanna set it down all the way down on the lateral mass. You wanna set it on the ring of C1. If you set this drill guide all the way down on the lateral mass, you're going to angle too cranially and you can violate the occipital cervical, occipital C1 joint. So maintain this drill guide on the C1 ring here. You, you drill, uh, we have our hole here. I always do my C2 fixation before I put my C1 screws in. So this is a C2 PAR screw. The joint of C2-3 is right here. So we're angling, uh, we're coming just above that joint. Uh, this patient didn't have C2 uh, uh, pedicles that were amenable to screw fixation. So we angled just slightly uh, cranially um, and slightly medially. So this is a C2 PARS screw. 
And then once we have our C2 fixation, we go and we put our C1 lateral mass screw in. Uh, this is oftentimes a 4.0 by uh, 32 millimeter screw. Again, another patient posterior dissection, we're removing this uh, Atlanta axial ligament off of the bottom of the C1 ring here. A lot of venous bleeding here. So we've, this is the C2 lamina. So we've marked the medial border of the C2 pedicle right here. Take a doll nerve hook. You can follow the C2 pedicle all the way ventrally. Take a, a Penfield one, and we can dissect the periosteum and the soft tissue all the way anteriorly and medially around the C2 pars here. So that shows you that uh, nice safe window. So this is a uh, starting point for a C2 pedicle screw. It's very lateral and just underneath this uh, cranial cortex here. So this, uh, the, the trajectory of a C2 pedicle screw is very medialized. So oftentimes your dissection, the wound doesn't allow you to get that medial angulation. Uh, sorry about that. So we're going to go. So what you can do is, is you can take this, um, you can take a, a um, towel clamp, okay? And you can have your assistant rotate the C2 splash process away from your, your point. And that takes that medial angulation out of the trajectory. So it's a much easier uh, trajectory to get your C2 a pedicle screw. What I like to do is after I cannulated the pedicle with the gear shift, I like to take some type of hemostat hemostatic agent like this is a uh, um, surgifoam. You can, it has a, a angiocath at the tip, insert it into your pilot hole. Oftentimes, if you've breached medially, you'll see the surgifoam come up through the canal, um, but oftentimes you know, it, it, it tells you that you have a good sound hole. You'll see the flow seal come out the path of least resistance. Uh, we tap just to make sure we have a good starting point, And then we can um, insert our C2 pedicle screws. Again, if I'm doing a uh, posterior C1-2 fixation, I like C2 pedicle screws first, uh, PAR screws if the, if the anatomy is not conducive, and then laminar screws. So it shows uh, the screw insertion here. Again, we're dissecting the um, uh, posterior elements. Oh, I don't know why it started over. Sorry about that. Okay, so moving on. So this is on the right side now. So this is without taking the C2 nerve root. What we often do is we take a Penfield 4 in the C12 joint and depress that nerve root and the vascular leash down. This is, shows you a right C2 um, PAR screw. So this is the C23 joint, kind of straight in and angled only slightly medial. I've marked the medial border of the C2 pedicle here. And then you can, uh, usually about a 16 or an 18 millimeter uh, a screw. So we've, uh, we used to do sublaminar wiring. Uh, that's a little bit more difficult. So once you have good uh, segmental fixation of C12, it's easy to pass a cable or a large non-absorbable suture around the rods because you have rigid fixation there. And then again, Oftentimes for traumatic issues, I still tend to use uh, corticocancellus autograft. So that's the video shows it being placed here. And then you simply cinch the wire or the cable or the suture um, around your corticocancellus autograft. Okay, so uh, thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing and I'll give it back to Ram. Thank you very much, Tim. That was an excellent presentation. I'll give you a small breather, by which time you can load your next set of slides, which is for the sacral fractures and sacral injuries. Uh, Vishal, any questions for Tim till the time that he loads his uh, sacral talk? Yeah, it was very interesting, Tim. In fact, <clears throat> I was impressed by the way you have utilized the surface of the occiput there uh, to get the fusion there. So my, my quick question is, 
Uh, have you tried having a single anchor? Like I saw your screws in the oxybocycle fixation being two in the C1 and two in the C2. Have yeah. you tried uh, having a transarticular screw uh, to, to yeah. be the lower anchor point for oxybocycle fusions there? Um, when I started out practice uh, about 17 years ago, I, I did transarticular screws. I was never, uh, I'm a little bit older, so I was never taught, you know, C1 lateral mass screws. I kind of taught myself that. So I have done transarticular screws, like the first five or six C12, pusher C12 fusions. I have used transarticular screws starting low in the, uh, uh, in the lateral mass of C2 and shooting up under direct fluoroscopic guidance. Those are very difficult for me. You have to have normal anatomy. And you're, if you're dealing with a fracture, you have to make sure that a dontoid fracture is completely and perfectly reduced. If not, you can get into the transverse frame and, and damage to the vertebral artery. C1 lateral mass screws and C2 fixation just is, uh, it's easier for me. It's, it's easier to teach. Oftentimes with transarticular screws, you're, you're relying on image guidance and it's not reproducible or teachable to residents and fellows. Right, thank you, thank you. So are you ready to go with the sacral fractures, Tim? I am ready to go. Thank you, Ram. So the, um, the point of this talk was sacral fractures, um, are they stable or are they unstable? We're gonna mostly show unstable sacral injuries. So I think it's one area of the body that orthopedic uh, surgeons, uh, I've worked at a level one trauma center for uh, almost 20 years and the orthopedic traumatologists swear that the sacrum is part of the spine. Me as a spine surgeon, I, I try to convince my orthopedic traumatologist that the sacrum is part of the pelvic ring. So it's kind of that uh, watershed area of where no one is truly an expert. Um, um, so it's kind of an evolving uh, area of discussion in how we treat these types of injuries. So I'm gonna try to point out kind of key points that we look at in terms of sacral injuries, uh, just through case examples. Because again, there's not a lot of um, good literature and data out there that, that tells us how we should treat these injuries. So case one, is a 26-year-old female jump from 30 feet. We talked about the LD50 for falls. So again, this is a high energy injury. She had significant bilateral lower extremity trauma. She had normal rectal tone. So this is her sagittal CT scan. 70 to 80% of sacral of high energy, normal, non-pathologic bone sacral fractures will be through the cranial portion of, of S2. So the majority of these injuries uh, are through S2. This is a classic um, CT, mid-sagittal CT scan. You get kyphosis through the fracture um, and you worry about neurologic injury with these. So these patients, if they don't have significant neurologic injury, when they come in, when they present to your institution, you want to make sure that they don't develop further kyphosis and develop neurologic injury, most concerning Cotiquinus syndrome, bound bladder uh, issues down the road. So this is a coronal CT scan, which shows significant um, hemipelvis vertical shear type of injury, zone, the knee zone to a sacral fracture and complete and significant elevation through the whole left hemipelvis, the right hemipelvis is maintained. So you see again, the fracture, a zone two through the sacral foramina, another coronal cut. This is again, a sat, I'm sorry, an axial view. So this is a significant high energy uh, mechanism injury with complete disruption of the left hemipelvis. Um, again, uh, just a, a sagittal CT scan. So through uh, very good communication with my orthopedic uh, uh, traumatologist, they tend to do the uh, um, SI screws, the sacroiliac screws. They, we do traction on the left hemipelvis to, to reduce the fracture, um, oftentimes transtibial or distal femoral traction, we, we place uh, you know, it, either a resident or a significant weight on the left hemipelvis. Under fluoroscopic guidance, we make sure that the hemipelvis is reduced. We look at the sacral foramina 
Um, again, you want um, mirror images of the sacral foramina. And then typically what happens, the orthopedic traumatologists shoot at least one or two um, uh, SI screws, depending on the windows through S1 or S2. And then especially with left um, or, or with uh, a vertical shear hemipelvises, we always offer ileal lumbar fixation with at least one pedicle screw on that side and then um, iliac bolts uh, into that side. And this rod then helps prevent uh, later uh, further elevation of the left hemipelvis. With pelvic ring injuries, we like to do iliac to iliac screws um, with a bar to control the hemipelvis or, or the pelvic ring also. And that's kind of the fun thing about treating these types of injuries is no one has the exact right answer. This is an evolving technology and, and how we treat these. I tend not to try to significantly reduce um, the kyphosis if the patients are neurologically intact. Um, I found that that's an exercise in futility, uh, do, doing sacral laminectomies and cobs in the fracture to reduce those only lead to actually in my hands, further neurologic injury than neurologic recovery. So this is her post-operative healed sagittal CT scan, which shows fusion um, through S2. Um, and then what I tend to do is I tend to offer removal of the lumbar pedicle screw to the iliac fixation. Because again, there's no fusion between the iliac uh, bolt and the um, lumbar pedicle screw. And again, this is a coronal, which shows uh, very good healing of the fracture. You always want to key in on the L5 S1 facet. Okay, that's how you uh, check your reduction, uh, especially if the facet is part of the uh, ring injury. So you get good uh, SI screw fixation across the fracture and then iliolumbar fixation. With a healed fracture, no, the sacral foramina aren't perfect, but this patient went on. She did not develop any late neurologic sequelae. A uh, 26-year-old male jumped from 30 feet, again, bilateral lower extremity tibial plafond fractures with normal rectal tone. So again, this is a, a sagittal CT scan with a fracture through S2, very, very common. Um, right hemipelvis disruption here with fractures through the sacral ala and zone two. You have um, um, kind of a hinge fracture on the left hemipelvis, again, the pubic symphysis is not disrupted here. This is a CT uh, reconstruction, which shows right-sided hemipelvis disruption through zone two of the sacrum. Again, a little bit of elevation. This is a posterior view through that same fracture. Um, and then this, this was uh, purely a uh, sacral fracture issue. So we don't rely on our general, uh, general ortho, I'm sorry, our orthopedic traumatologist to maintain the pelvic ring. This is a pure sacral fracture. This is a U or a H type fracture. So what we do, what we tend to do with these is again, lumbar pedicle screw fixation, iliac bolts uh, bilaterally to control. And you just got to think of it, go back to your orthopedic tenants proximal fixation versus a uh, distal fixation. So you wanna control the proximal part of the fracture, that's the lumbar spine. You wanna control the distal part of the fracture, that's the entire pelvis. So we get good fixation in both. Um, I tend to use just one, uh, one pedicle screw on each side. Uh, I've been fairly successful in treating that. And then this is a post-operative CT scan showing uh, heal, healing of the fracture. Again, you, you want to key on the sacral uh, foramina. They aren't perfect, but you have bony healing across the right hemipelvis here. And again, we don't try to correct uh, a significant kyphosis if the patient is neurologically intact. These are very vascular injuries. They tend to heal predictably. So this is a healed CT scan through that superior part of S2. Um, and again, I, I offer removal of the hardware between the lumbar pedicle screws and the iliac fixation, because if not, theoretically, you can get significant L5S1 uh, degeneration. A little bit off on the left side here, but it, definitely appropriate. So case three, 
48 year old male, crush injury, chest injury, no rectal tone, no bowel or bladder function. So this is a, a sort of a polytrauma patient who is an extremist as they come in. So you can see from this AP pelvis, anterior uh, rami, a root of the rami disruption. You have bilateral sacral fractures through zone two uh, in a patient who is hemodynamically unstable. So you see spondyloptosis essentially through the superior part of S2 with disruption uh, between uh, the sacrum at S1 and S2 here. This is an axial CT scan. Again, high energy injury. You want to make sure that the patient is hemodynamically stable before you offer. You're not going to improve their neurologic status by any extreme measures. So uh, make sure the patient is resuscitated before you uh, offer definitive stabilization. Just another axial CT scan. And the sacral ala just tends to disappear with these high energy injuries. It's very thin, mostly cortical bone, and with significant energy. Uh, you're, you don't, you oftentimes don't have a lot to work with in terms of SI screw fixation from our orthopedic traumatologists. So this is the construct that we uh, ended up doing. So L4 um, and L5 pedicle screws, we did bilateral iliac bolt fixation. Um, our orthopedic traumatologists uh, temporarily um, spanned uh, the pelvis with um, an anterior uh, inferior iliac spine fixation here. Um, this is something, this construct we tend to leave until we know that we have bony fusion, oftentimes eight to 10 months. This is a lateral view and then a lateral CT or a sagittal CT scan, which does show bony healing. We got a little bit of a reduction, but we, we're not going to um, spend uh, six or eight hours in the operating room uh, trying to get a perfect reduction because those uh, cases are wrought with infection. We gave the patient uh, a stable S1, S2 segment. He did regain some bowel and bladder function, but I tell these patients the neurologic injury that you have when you present is likely the neurologic injury you're going to be left with in terms of bowel and bladder dysfunction. So one more case, a 19-year-old PEDS versus CAR isolated injury the patient uh, presents uh, three days after her trauma to my institution with searing, just the most debilitating, disesthetic. Uh, she uh, doesn't allow anyone to touch her right leg, mostly on the posterior approach, with normal bowel and bladder function. So again, this is a U-type sacrum with uh, complete disruption through S2 with uh, narrowing and pretty much occlusion of the right S1 foramina here. This is just a sagittal uh, a CT, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, coronal CT reconstruction, which shows the fracture line. So what we chose for her is the goal for her was to decompress. She's 19 years old. We wanted to make sure that we decompress that S1 foramen. So this is the construct for that U-type sacrum. You want to control the cranial segment of the fracture here, which is the lumbar spine, and control the distal uh, fracture fragment, which is the pelvis. So bilateral iliac bolts. L4, L5 pedicle screws in this construct. And then we did an extensive um, open S1 foraminotomy. We opened up that S1 foramen, and then this is her healed. Not a perfect uh, sacrum here. The sacral ala is a little bit off, but we the goal of the surgery was attained with fusion of the sacral fracture and then decompression of the S1 lamina. One more case, a 54-year-old high-speed motor vehicle crash, multiple injuries, Neurostatus is unknown. Uh, this is an illustration uh, that you want to key in on the L5 S1 facet joint. So, as you do an open approach posteriorly, you want to, with your orthopedic traumatologist, you want to key in on the diastasis here and reduce the pelvis to the spine. And the key is this L5 S1. Uh, facet joint here. So again, significant diastasis disruption. This patient had complete loss of bowel and bladder uh, function uh, with no rectal tone. Again, CT uh, uh, reconstruction showing the right uh, significant disruption. This is with the X fix. Um, and this is what we chose to do two SI joints by my orthopedic uh, traumatologist. Then because it's mostly right sided, L4. Uh, L5 pedicle screws, iliac bolt, and then one bolt on the left side con to control the pelvic ring injury posteriorly because they didn't have good fixation anteriorly. We 
we did okay. We probably could have done better. But again, this is to illustrate that L5 S1 facet. That's your key. If you're reducing a both bone forearm fracture, you want to pose the fractures, you want to look at the fracture fragment. Uh, this is how we do it with these sacral fractures. We key in at the L5 S1 facet. Um, this patient went on to develop a stable non union with mostly uh, just. Uh, uh, axial pain when he's on his feet for more than two or three hours. So we felt that from that injury, this was a fairly good um, outcome. Again, you can see the non-union here, but fairly good opposition of the fractures. Uh, with that, that's how we treat our uh, sacral fractures. Um, we want to prevent further kyphosis and further neurologic injury. Um, probably twice a year, I'll see a patient with a missed sacral fracture who comes in with significant cotyquinus syndrome, urgency or loss of bowel and bladder control. So we wanna be astute, make sure we image these things well. Um, everyone in our institution gets um, CT scans and we wanna prevent further neurologic deficit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim, for an excellent extensive coverage of uh, a watershed zone between the spine and the autotrauma guys. And I'm sure that uh, there's a lot to evolve still in these sacral injuries. Um, we have, as a team, uh, slightly overshot on our time. Uh, rather than do a complete session on osteoporotic fractures, I would request uh, Vishal to just summarize um, without a PowerPoint, in short, uh, what are the takeaway messages he would like to give for a person who comes to him postmenopausal osteoporotic fracture in a lady who's got new, no neurology, another one who's got impending neurology. So Vishal, just a take home. We let uh, Tim you. rest for a couple of minutes and then we have our final discussion. Yes, yes. Thank you, Dr. Ram. I think it's more sensible. So I think osteoporotic fractures are growing and uh, by the end of the day, while we go to our beds, we would have added almost uh, 20,000 more patients with osteoporotic fractures in various regions, either in hip or radius or in spine. And that's why we need to be understand the basics of osteoporosis. And I think the four carry home messages for all of us to remember in osteoporotic patients is that any patient with clinical risk factors post-menopausal, more than five years of uh, menopausal stage, having any kind of uh, trivial fall and injury to spine, one must suspect that they are dealing with the osteoporotic fracture and you should not wait for the diagnosis to be made purely on MRI. The diagnosis of osteoporotic fracture is based purely on clinical suspicion and one must have a very high index of clinical suspicion. So point number one is that suspect osteoporosis on in every patient who's got clinical risk factors, uh, be it smoking, alcoholism, more than 55 years of age, more than five years postmenopausal, trivial fall, injury to spine. So these are all factors where we should determine you and push you to start osteoporotic treatment in these patients, number one. Number two, not all fractures in elderly females that you see on x-rays are because of osteoporosis. There may be underlying pathology which can also be contributing to such fractures. And that is why Despite you being seeing a fracture on an X-ray or an MRI in an elderly known osteoporotic patient, you must try to investigate them, utilize the opportunity to rule out any myeloma, lymphoma, and for that matter, uh, any kind of metastatic disease in the spine. And there are radiological factors which determine or help you to understand that these are subtle uh, or innocuous osteoporotic fractures versus pathological fractures like lymphoma, myeloma, where there is ballooning of the vertebral body, where the fracture is through and through the spine, when there is a neurological deficit or when there is a soft tissue injury. All this should raise a suspicion that these fractures, although there is osteoporosis, but there is a secondary component to fractures also. And number three, 90% uh, of osteoporotic fractures would heal just by good medical treatment. And you must be extremely aggressive in treating them medically. And the medical treatment involves not only the modern drugs like teriparatide, denisumab, or for that matter, modern bisphosphonates that are available, but also general care, which involves positive nitrogen balance by giving them high protein diet, giving them bed rest, managing their pain quite well, giving them calcium and vitamin D supplements. Of course, it's a debatable topic to when to start, how much to give, for how long to give. But the idea is to start as early as possible, continue for as long as possible, treat them with the best medical care and be very aggressive in general care of developing their 
muscle strength, ex promoting exercises, preventing further falls, giving very high protein diet in these patients, and that's very, very important. And number four, as I said, 90% of these fractures heal. It also has a hidden clause that 10% of these fractures will not heal over a period of time despite the best of our medical care. And you must follow them very, very closely because 10% of these patients may either develop pseudoarthrosis related persistent pain or they may actually go into impending or frank neurology. And it is only when you follow these patients constantly, stringently at a regular follow-up interval, will you be able to catch them early. And that's when you'll be able to intervene at the right time to give the minimum possible intervention to give the best medical and surgical care for them. When it comes to surgery, of course, vertebroplasty versus surgery are questions that always run into your mind. But the answer to this is that vertebroplasty is meant only for patients where the posterior ligamentous complex is intact, posterior vertebral column is intact, the posterior end plate is intact. It's only then the vertebroplasty helps for all other patients where posterior ligamentous complex is even indeterminately injured or there is more than 30 degree kyphosis or a large void is there or even a subtle neurological deficit can be seen impending compressing on the cord. I think surgery should be done. And when you're planning to do a surgery, don't depend on the usual biomechanics of two above below. You rather go and do a long fixation and augment your screws either by cement augmented screws, by threaded screws, or even cement augmented screws and try to use sublaminar wires in these patients. So I think with this, these are the basic principles one must all remember in these patients with osteoporotic fractures. Thank you, you Vital. That was a fantastic overview of how to handle osteoporotic vertebral compression fractures. Now, before we wind up, any final tips, tricks, pearls of wisdom from Tim? Tim, anything that you would like to add to your presentations, which could um, help? No, just, you know, with, with these difficult injuries, you know, no one is truly an expert. Uh, the people who tend to know uh, the most are the, the, the surgeons who tend to treat a lot of these. So, you know, reach out uh, to those people if you get uh, these types of injuries. Think about, just go back to your basic orthopedic tenets, you know, dislocations, need to be reduced. And, you know, if, if you have a, if you have a um, dislocated spine, just think about your orthopedic tendons. How are you going to reduce that spine? Traction tends to usually work, even if it, you know, is a dislocation in the spine. Um, with sacral fractures, you just want to, typically we want to prevent uh, uh, sequelae of neurologic injury. So if that lumbar spine is disrupted with the pelvis, just think of it as a long bone. You want to stabilize the lumbar spine, which is the, the proximal fragment, to the distal spine, uh, which is the pelvis, and that's usually done through some type of iliolumbar fixation. And, you know, be very concerned about the high energy uh, fracture through S2 with only a minimal, uh, with only a small amount of kyphosis, because those are the ones, because of the high energy mechanism, those are the ones that's that are going to present later, you know, four or five months later with worsening kyphosis and neurologic issues. And that's something when treating sacral fractures, we definitely uh, want to prevent. Thank you so much, Tim. So may I thank the Boot OTA team for having get, got us together for this spine trauma session. Thank you very much, Tim, for having joined us early in the morning from the United States of America. And stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you so much, Vishal, for your contributions. And you've really been a big asset to this particular team. And we thank all the organizers who got this entire project together. Thank you very much, all the attendees. I hope we have helped you and have added something for you to think about and modify your practice in the near future. Thank you so much. God bless you. Stay safe. Stay healthy.